Good morning, YouTube. <clears throat> it's another day here in West Michigan. It is October the 2nd, 2018. It is 7.57 in the morning here in West Michigan, near Lake Michigan. It is, uh, as I look out the windows, <clears throat> I see that it's gray and wet. Hopefully, maybe the sun will come out this uh, today, but I don't really know. So it's a Tuesday. It's the morning. I'm having a... I finished reading this morning that essay I mentioned in this book. I got this book yesterday in the mail from Puritan Reform Theological Seminary. Uh, Puritan Piety. Writings in the honor of Joel R. Beakey. As I said, that jo uh, Joel R. Beakey is the president of Re Puritan Reform Theological Seminary. He's a prolific writer. He is a minister of a church in Grand Rapids, Heritage Reform Church. He is in the Dutch Reform. Dutch Puritan Reform, theological, spiritual, spirituality tradition. Uh, he promotes the, the 17th century English Puritans, the Dutch Puritans. And I've known Dr. Beakey for 40 years. <laughs> uh, ever since... Uh, when we were in Bible college, uh, I used to walk up to his church in the afternoons on Sunday. They would have a, an afternoon service down in the basement in Beaky's church. And upstairs they had a Dutch service. And then downstairs, one of the elders of the church would read a sermon by one of the uh, English Puritans or one of the Dutch Puritans, they would read them, these elders, and it was like sitting under preaching, and I would go to these services in the afternoons about one o'clock and get home around three o'clock. And uh, Beaky just began, they had a minister, uh, Reverend Lemain, and then he passed away, and then Beaky became the minister. Beaky was one of the youngest ministers in that denomination at that time. Now, several years ago, Beaky uh, separated from that group and has his own group now. And um, it's a long story. So uh, I'm not really friends with Beaky, but over the years I've talked to him and like I said, for many years, I would listen to his sermons when I when we lived in Mississippi. Every month, they sent me his sermons, and I would send them back. <clears throat> and then, when I was mo we moved up here, back to Holland, Michigan, from Texas. Well, I was in seminary. I got his sermons, and then when we lived in Houston, Texas, when I did my internship there at Covenant PCA under Dr. Joseph Piper Jr., who's also friends with Dr. Beakey. Uh, I get his sermons. And, and then when we moved up here about 28 years ago from Texas, I still got his sermons and then I got busy with work and raising the family and I stopped getting them. I stopped. I used to listen to sermons, the cassettes, for many, many years. But then the last, oh, I say the last, how many years? 14, 15 years, I can't listen to cassette sermons. I just, I stopped getting them. Now, you, you can go online and listen to Dr. Beaky's sermons if you want to go online. You can, there's... There's even, uh, in YouTube, you can type in Dr. Joel Beakey, and he has 
there are videos of Dr. Beaky preaching and lecturing. All for those who are curious. <laughs> anyway, I finished reading that first essay, which was, What is Theology? A Puritan Reformed Vision of Living to God Through Christ by the Spirit by Ryan M. McCraw. I didn't know. One thing about the volume that kind of bothered me is that it doesn't tell you who these men are who wrote these different uh, writings. So I, I looked up last night, who is this Ryan... Ryan M. McGraw. Well, he is the Associate Professor of Theology at Greenville Seminary there in, I think, North or South Carolina. Because the president of Greenville Seminary is Dr. Joseph Piper Jr., who I did my ministerial internship under. He's now the president there, and I think he teaches historical theology. He has a, a doctorate in historical theology from Westminster Seminary. So I looked him up. He also is involved with uh, Dr. Beakey. They edit a series. He calls it back here. He says, uh, Joel Beakey and I are co-editing the Cultivating Biblical Godliness series. So he's involved with publishing material with Dr. Beakey. So I was reading that, and then I uh, last night when I was reading this essay, he quoted, he's always quoting uh, Dr. McCraw. He's quoting the English Puritans. He also quotes John Calvin and Luther. But I, in one of the quotes, he quoted... Uh, He quoted Edward Reynolds, and he quoted from a sermon called Meditations on the Fall and Rising of St. Peter by Edward Reynolds. And I thought, well, I have the works of Edward Reynolds. They've been rep repented, and I thought I'd just show them to you. These are the works of Edward Reynolds. He was another 17th English uh 17th century English Puritan. Uh, wait a minute. He said Edward Reynolds was born in no November 1593. He showed great knowledge and skill in the study of, of the Greek and language and was distinguished as a good dispute and orator at Merton College in Oxford. After receiving his Master of Arts degree, he entered the ministry, became an eminent preacher, his works comprising six volumes and reprint. In 1643, he was chosen as one of the Assembly of Divines at Westminster and is represented as giving constant attendance during the sessions. He was a covenanter and a frequent preacher in London. Following this, he was chosen Dean of Christ Church and Vice Chancellor of the University in 1648. In 1660, along with Edward Camley, Reynolds was made chaplain to the King. He preached several times to the king in parliament. And then it goes on. So these, uh, there's a picture of, of Edward Reynolds. He lived from 1593 to 1676, Bishop of Norwich. So, sounds like he was one of those Puritans that stayed within the Church of England. But this is his uh, works. You have his commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes. And also, yeah, then you have, uh, this is volume four, Meditations on the Holy Sacrament and the Lord's Last Supper. This is volume three. Also in this is that uh, Meditations on the Holy Sacrament and the Lord's Supper. And then a treatise on passions and faculties of the soul. And then exaltation of Christ and exposition of Psalm 110. This is the one I've read. You can tell it's kind of beat up. <laughs> I read this many years ago when I got these. These were published, reprinted in by Soli di Gloria reprint in 1993. 
And then the sinfulness of sin. This one's really beat up. This is one I read a lot of. Uh, so this is the sinfulness of sin. This is the one that was first published and then they published the other one. So this is volume one. This is Exaltation of Christ is volume two. And then this is Preaching Christ, volume five of his works. And uh, so I just got them out to look at. I don't know where that sermon is. Oh, here it is. I think this is it. Yeah, here it is. I think it is. I don't know. I marked it, but I can't remember where, which volume it was in. <laughs> Let me see here. Where was that Meditations? Exaltation of Christ, was that it? No. Preaching Christ. Some was in the sinfulness of sin. Anyway, I can't find it now, but anyway. I looked at it and I I looked at these last night. But uh, now I can't find that meditation on the Fall of St. Peter. So I got these out. These are kinds of books I read for many years. Like I said, I didn't really get into reading secular literature because I was working and I was raising our family and I was teaching Sunday school and I was always exhausted. So I only could read books that would nourish my spiritual life. And so I read theology I read the Puritans, I read the Bible, and I did that for many, many years. And I, like I said, I did read once in a while something by Jack Kerouac or John Irving, or I would read John Updike. But most of the time, I would just read the Puritans, or I would listen to sermons by Dr. Beakey. And that's what I did for many years. Now here it is. It's found in the Meditations on the Fall and Rising of Peter. It's found in this a commentary in the book of Ecclesiastes. And this is the quote from this essay by uh, What is Theology? He says, Meditation 16. The form and manner of Paul's second denial is not without reason, as I conceive, diversely related. In one evangelist, the words are, I know not the man, and another, I am not of them. These are the words that uh, the Apostle Peter spoke after the Lord was arrested, and they asked, the, the, the Roman authorities asked him, Do you know this man? And Peter, his answer was, I know not the man, and another, I am not of them. He's saying, I'm not of the disciples of the Lord Jesus. One would think these were two denials. May not a man know him unless he follow him? No, behold a mystery of faith in the fall of Peter. No man knows Christ unless he be one of them that follow him and to whom he has united himself. If it had been true, I am not one of them. It had been a true also, I know not the man. All knowledge consists in a mixture and union, whereby the understanding receiveth into it the image and similitude of the things which it knows, which made the philosopher say that the soul in understanding a thing is made the very thing which understands, namely in that sense as we call the image of the face and the glass the face itself, or the impression in wax the seal itself. Now then, where there is no union between Christ and us, no dwelling of him in us, no engrafture or incorporation of us into him without that faith whereby we follow him, which makes us to be so nearly one with him, that in the judgment of the learned, the name of Christ is sometimes in Holy Scripture taken for the church of Christ. And therefore, to those that believe, to them only has he given to know 
Christ is not truly apprehended either by the fancy or the understanding. He is at once known and possessed. It is experimental and not a speculative knowledge. See, you get that? This knowledge of God, this knowledge of Christ, is experimental and not a speculative knowledge that conceives him. He understands him, that feels him. See, if you understand, if you comprehend, if you know God, you feel him. There's an experimental, there's an experience of the knowledge of God. Not only is there a sound doctrine, but there's a sound heart knowledge. We see him in his grace and truth, in his word and promises, not in any carnal or gross presence. A true believer can see and know him better in heaven at the right hand of his Father. By a sacramental, by a sacramental, then a papist can on the altar in the Jewish and Pilate hands of the mass priests by the substantiated bread. Let their faith have the assistance of teeth and jaws. Ours, though toothless, eats him with less injury and with more nourishment. He's kind of, he's just attacking the, the Roman doctrine of the Catholic Mass. Anyway, so that's kind of like a little bit of Edward Reynolds. These are kind of things I read many years ago when I was raising our family and working on hauling trucks with eggs and it was, very, it was a very hard time, you know, being married and raising kids and working and it was very difficult because I was by nature I'm kind of an introverted, insecure, freaked out, struggled with depression and my job, I hated my job it was, and I struggled with assurance and just all the different things that you deal with just being a fallen sanctified Christian. So this morning I got I got well I got those Edward Dwindles out. I thought I'd show them to you. I thought I'd show you I also was reading this morning and once again post Reformation Reform Dogmatics, the rise and development of Reform Orthodoxy from fifteen twenty to seventeen twenty five. Volume 1, Promagama and Theology by Richard Muller. I thought I'd show you the other volumes just for fun. People show in booktube their, their romances, their thrillers, their comic books, their science fiction, their, uh, their graphic novels. So I thought I'd show you my, ref my post-Reformation Reform dogmatics. <laughs> Why not? This is Volume 2. Holy Scripture, the Cognitive Foundations of Theology, and Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics. And then you have Volume 3, Divine Essence and the Attributes, Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics by Richard Muller. And then the Volume 4, the, the Triunity of God, Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics, The Rise and Development of Reform Orthodoxy from 1520 to 1725 by Richard Muller. These are the kind of things I would read when I was, you know, for many, many years. Um, I've shown you my Richard Muller collection in past videos. So I would read Richard Muller, and then I would read Edward Reynolds. Also, I... Talk about Reformed Dogmatics, I was down there and I thought I'd show, these are things I've read for many years. This is a one volume Reformed Dogmatics set out and illustrated from sources by Herrick Hemp. I read this, as I look through it, I just, it's all marked up. I read this for many years, even before I read Richard Muller. This came out in, this is Baker Bookhouse. This came out in 1978. And then I also have this one, Reformed Dogmatics, 17th Century Reformed Theology through the writings of Wubius, Voltus, and Tertian. So, and this is translated and edited and translated by John W. Beersley III. These are the kind of things I'd read as I was, when I'd come home from hauling eggs and 
you know, covered with egg slop and sweat and, you know, my hand, you know, my hands and my back and my body screaming in pain and my soul screaming in pain and wondering what is going on and just being slammed against the wall. I would read Reformed Dogmatics. That's what I would do. I'd go to my study and I'd sit there and write in my diary and I'd read Reformed Dogmatics. And of course, you know, I was involved in our family, our kids, our wife, our dog. Back then we had a dog named Rudy and then we had, a, before Rudy, we had a dog named Mac. So I'm just rambling here. Now it's 8.17. I just thought, you know, I just... Since this is Tuesday morning, tomorrow, Wednesday, my wife will come home in the evenings and then life will get back to somewhat normal. So yeah, I got, re I got reform, re Rise Reform System this morning and Merrill Theology by William Ames, and Theoretical Practical Theology by Petrus Van Manstrand, and Richard Baxter, Saints Everlasting Rest, lot to read, to ponder, to think about as we head into the eternal state, waiting for the coming of Christ, uh, just trying to stay, stay cool, <laughs> stay cool. So anyway, I just thought I'd share these things with you, my little book world. Sorry I don't have any graphic novels or comic books or science fiction or thrillers or I'm just kind of a dud, I suppose. But these are the kind of things, like I said, I'm a Christian bookworm. These are the kind of things a Christian would read as he waits to go into the eternal state, to be with Christ in glory. So, hoping you ha will have a good day. Until next time, bye.